You get tired after a long day of work, you sit down, a long day walk, you sit down to rest. You uh, are thirsty and someone comes up that has a, a way to draw some water for you, you, you ask if they would please get you some. Everyday kind of stuff. That's what we see take place here in this exchange in John chapter 4. Then there's the, the more gritty variety of everyday stuff. There's the kind of, of tension that we see exist between different people groups. Maybe there's a lot of history there. Maybe it's because of the way one group treated the other, or both groups were acting towards one another. In any case, there's some hesitation to talk, to associate, to show any kind of friendship. Barriers are erected. A divide is created. Jesus was tired. He was thirsty. This shouldn't surprise us for a very, a very human individual. Jesus, true God from all eternity, became fully human, just like us, for us. Then, then Jesus departs from the ordinary. And, and he doesn't give credence to the tension. He, he doesn't follow the, the protocol that these two people groups, these two neighboring nations had established. He, he associates with this Samaritan woman and, and befriends the, the Samaritan woman. And if you follow through in John chapter 4 with the entire town of Sychar as well. A soul is a soul to God, after all. It doesn't matter what nationality, what, what race you are. To Him, every soul is precious. And that leads us back to the ordinary that we see take place in John chapter 4 in our broken world. This woman has, she arrives this day, although... She's carrying a water bucket that's empty. She's carrying a heavy burden. And maybe we get some indication of that by the, the time of day where she's arriving at, at this well. Why, why would anyone choose to go out in the, the very hottest point of the day? It seems like everybody else doesn't want to do this except for this woman. And so maybe, maybe that's the very reason that she's there at this time. Can, can you think of an instance where, where you didn't want to hear maybe what people had to say to you or maybe about you? And one solution often enacted would be, would be simple avoidance, right? And what better a, a tactic to avoid people than to avoid the places where they go at the times that they go there so you, you don't bump into them and hear the comments that you, you fear? But you, you hear it, right? That, that sounds very lonely. I mean, we, we find out later in the conversation and exchange that this woman did have different um, relationships and connections. The only thing is, a great many of them had ended. And badly. And we don't know how many of them um, broke up because that was a uh, fault on her side. Or how many were at the fault of, of a husband of hers? Or how many had, had some blame and some wrong on, on both parties' part? But whatever the history of those past relationships, in her present relationship, we see very clearly from Jesus' words that she's, she's out of step with God's will for marriage. And it seems from the way that she responds that she, she understands when Jesus brings it up later in the conversation, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't deny anything about it. She, Jesus points out her sin and, and she accepts what he says. So with that backdrop in mind, picture her walk out to the well this day. See her arrive. And Jesus is there. Jesus is there waiting for her. And Jesus reaches out to her. Jesus initiates the conversation with her. Sure, he, he asks for a drink. And she has a, a way to, to help him. And he's not faking that. He's, he's thirsty, 
But very quickly, you see, he, he wants to move this conversation on to more important things. And you see, very quickly, he's more concerned about her and her need than he's concerned about himself and his own need. Do we ever even hear if Jesus got a drink? That's not the point. So, so what is the point? Jesus reaches across cultures. Jesus reaches out to the hurting person in front of him. He is the fix for our brokenness. And it doesn't take long. That's one thing that jumped out at me as I look back at this account. It only took Jesus' second comment, right? And he's already to the deepest level issue. And the most important issue for every single one of us. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked Him. And He would have given you living water. And then after a brief reply from the woman, He gets right back to, to it. Right? He gets right back to this, this topic. He, he says, each one who drinks from the water I give him will never thirst again. The water I give him will become in him water welling up to eternal life. See your Savior's love that reaches out to the lost soul, the lost and hurting soul and thirsting soul. He attached no qualifier. He, he, didn't, he didn't say, as, as many pe people of Jesus' time, many Jews of Jesus' time thought, that, that this was, was primarily for, for one race, for, for one nation. No, it, it's, for, it's for all this offer that he gives. And he doesn't attach a qualifier saying, if you get your life cleaned up well enough, then, then I'll give you this gift. That's the world's thinking still today. And it was popular in Jesus' day too. If you're just good enough, then, then I'll give you this gift. No, he doesn't say this. He says, this is a gift from God, and it's for all people of all nations, of, of all races. And it's a gift given freely to the recipient, to, to us, Right? Trust in Him for it. But here's the thing in this exchange. Did this woman understand how great her need was for it, or her, her absolute need for it? And did she understand that the one talking to her was the only one who could give this gift and this life? Jesus had to show her. And in order to do that, He took the conversation to a topic she may have preferred not to to have aired, at least at first, her relationships. And our collective 21st century culture lets out a big gasp. Oh! <laughs> because this isn't popular. It's not popular to, to people. It's not popular to talk so, so directly, so openly about someone's sins. But that's what our God does with, with each individual. He, he takes us to, to see our sin because He cares. He leads us to see our need for Him, our Savior, so that we might be led also by the Holy Spirit to trust in Him as the Savior. Jesus cared so much about this dear soul in front of Him. He talked her through the truth about her life. All on the way to the, his effort and his goal to connect her to himself. Now undoubtedly, undoubtedly, this woman had been, had been searching for, for happiness, had been searching for, for contentment in her life, but searching down avenues that would only end up at dead ends, at disappointment, at pain, at hopelessness in the end. And here's the thing to understand. As we look closely at this account, we get a glimpse into our own personal lives, too. While the details may, may be different, there's a common thread to identify. The thirst that we all share. Everyone is seeking happiness. Everyone is seeking contentment. And where do people turn to find ultimate happiness and contentment. Will enough money and the, the things that money can buy, will that bring someone ultimate and lasting contentment? 
Kids, do you ever think, do you ever think, if I only had and then the blank, then I'd be happy. If I only had the, the latest and greatest toy that every other kid seems to have, then I would be happy. If I only had the game, the video game, or the, the game that everyone is talking about, then I would be happy. If only I could have a limitless number of times that I could go to Jump Masters or, or what other, other activity you really enjoy. If you had that, you feel, then you would be happy and content. God blesses our lives with so many good things. But if we begin to think that those good things are the basis for how we are happy and why we are happy and have fulfillment, then we've elevated them to too high of a place, to a place that only, really, God deserves. So then getting back to the topic of relationships, what if our looking for happiness slips into a similar pattern to the Samaritan woman's? You need not have her divorce record in order to have similar steps parallel to, to the ones that the woman took. Is it possible to place too high a priority on people in our life and, and relationships in our life? Think at this point not only of romantic relationships, but also of, of friendships in, in general. If the presence or the acceptance or the respect and love of a person or of people in our lives is what we think we need in order to have ultimate happiness and fulfillment, then we, we've got things mixed up, and that's too high of a place that we're giving to, to that. I heard, at, I heard at middle school age that there are many girls who think that if they do not have a boyfriend, then they, they are not happy. But that's, that's what will bring them, them happiness. And I'm sure there are some boys in, in middle school or, or high school who feel, who feel that, or who feel that way about, about friendships in general. Concern over that or over what peers think of us are given too high of a place and priority in our lives if we think that that's what's going to really make us happy. That's where our happiness comes from or depends on. Others, middle school age, yes, and, even, and then right on up from there in age are chasing after whatever kind of relationship they feel will make them happy, denying what God says about sins like hookups and same-sex relationships. And, and then there's this relationship topic that goes like this temptation. Relationships are all just too hard. So why, why bother with them? Here's a way that you can have satisfaction with all the, without all the work of a relationship. There's a whole industry that suggests that, porn. But it's a lie. It'll never truly satisfy. And the relationship, by God's design, of a, of a man and a woman, in the intimacy and, and joy of a marriage, is exchanged and, and, and dispatched of for the loneliness of an individual sitting before a flickering screen or looking down at the pages of, of, a, of a book that stir the same kind of, of desires. And it's totally false to think that just because the individual is alone, that nobody is hurt in those cases. Relationships are hurt. First of all, it's, it's against God's will, and it also hurts others. And it also hurts the individual. So, whether it's attitudes about material stuff, or it's, it's wrong views about relationships, we should have all... All of us should have eyes opened and ready to see where we have stepped wrong when it comes to seeking happiness in wrong places. And I know those are heavy and kind of hard topics to hear about and be brought, have brought out in the open. We each have skeletons in the closet, but God, God does not ignore them. He opens the closet door. He uses His law to show us what is sin, and to then bring us to repentance for that sin, all in the effort to keep us connected to Him. Connected to Him with faith in Him. Faith in Him, the, 
the one source and only way to have true and ultimate and lasting happiness. Jesus masterfully led this Samaritan woman through to this conclusion. The remedy for her thirsting soul, she was seeking happiness. The remedy for her search for happiness was standing right in front of her. The one through whom all nations will be blessed and have been blessed was there with her, was there for her. It was his mission to seek and to save the lost, to bring us salvation. From here, he went on in his mission, right? When he would not be standing anywhere, but he would be hanging on the cross. And there he hung and he suffered and he died. He took the hell punishment for all our sins. And that means for you, through faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son, you have all of the lasting blessings of God. Forgiveness of all your sins gifted you. A peace with God and the love of God that will last forever. A, a love and a relationship that is lasting. And not only with Him will you get to enjoy eternal life, but with the entire family of God that has faith in Jesus. Now, sometime we should talk some more about IQ. Um, I found this, you know, you know IQ, right? The intelligence quotient, right? And so, more recently, awareness has grown about not only the importance of intelligence for life and for, and for you know, healthiness, but also um, emotional intelligence. You've heard about that. So, IQ and, and EQ balance. And now I found out there's also RQ, right? Um, relationship intelligence. And it's been highlighted and acknowledged how much, how much relationships and healthy relationships contribute to our, our happiness in life. Jesus has led us today, again, to see the foundational relationship for each one of us to have happiness. It comes through our connection to Him and having a, a, a right standing with Him to have everything right in our relationship with God through Jesus, to have forgiveness of sins and life eternal. And then we can see every other relationship in its proper place. You are precious to Jesus, and every other soul, every other individual is precious to Jesus. Treasure them in the same way that He treasures you and treasures them. Turn to His Word to guide you in your interactions with them, and with the love that he has poured into your heart and given you, show love and compassion to those around you. Amen. 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 And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.